Welcome back. Class is again in session. This is your ever broiling Professor Hamby here with How Are You Not Heat Stroked T.A. Rowan. Hello, Rowan. Hello. You look how I feel. So happy that Miskatonic, after screwing up that thing with Tasmanian dollars, is apparently trying to make up the financial loss by not using AC in the middle of a Massachusetts summer. Now, I understand people think it doesn't get that hot in Massachusetts, but here in the Miskatonic Valley, heat just sits. It's like sleeping under a giant bison's testicles all summer, just hot and sweaty, with a vague smell that you're too afraid to find out where it's from. I wouldn't claim I know what that feels like, but fair. It's rough. It's rough. Now, our last podcast was discussing the end of Sandman's Kindly Ones. Mm -hmm. We are going to take a break from Sandman for this lecture to do what I had intended to be a Pride Month episode. Mm -hmm. Except we managed to miss the rest of Pride Month. How dare you? We actually missed it because you said you were too hot to record. That was one day. One day becomes two days becomes... Look, we don't have opportunities to record every day. I mean, I have a very busy schedule of barely fulfilling my legal obligations in my job. Uh. It's true. I need plausible deniability for avoiding teaching the youth of tomorrow. Oh, John. I know. I don't have it easy like co my college professors did. They didn't have to explain why they didn't actually teach me anything. But I have to seem like I'm working. It, it feels really unfair. So, what I thought we'd do for Pride Month is we'd ignore the complete travesty that was the Marvel Pride books. Mm. Actually, did they even do any? They did. Okay. I don't think I read this year's. DC's books, however, were just pathetic. And one of them, the best part of the book, was the introdu introduction written by the DC archivist. Oh, joy. And the other one had an introduction recycled from their Pride book from last year. They had a whole year and they recycled something? Oh, not something. Just about everything. They couldn't even get a new introduction. Randall Capitalism this year just isn't hitting the same as it did last year. No, it's just not. Come on, if, if you're going to take advantage of us for one month, do it right. I know. Provide something. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty sad. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those because I'm just not in the mood and I don't feel like rage ranting about, you know, poor representation and token gestures to mm -hmm. communities. Instead, I'm going to talk about lesbians. Let's go. All right. So, not really lesbians, although there is a lot of lesbian in this one. But we're going to return to the document that I started. And people can find the old version on my Tumblr. They'll be able to find the new version with new edits on Tumblr as well. Mm -hmm. Talking about common elements of Yuria's literature. Mm -hmm. Now... Folks can't see this, but the version I have on screen right now has changes and additions in red. And one of the changes I'm making to the document is that instead of simply talking broadly and abstractly, I am also beginning to cite specific works and how they fit into these criteria. And we're going to go through four of them today. So we're going to start with the fact that I think that the themes I have been defining need to be more specifically called relationship themes. And it's important to deconstruct so that we can speak with more precision about the nature of Yuri relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, since Yuri is girls love comics, mm -hmm. I did some thinking about some of the terminology used. Mm -hmm. And we previously had talked about familial love and romantic love and sexual love. And I rephrased two, the, the remaining two. 
One I'm calling familiar love. And I kind of fought against that because familiar and familial can sound very close together. And I don't want people to become confused about that. But the more I tried to use other words, the more I found myself unconsciously going back and using familiar love. So I think it is a valid term. It is about shared experiences. Now, those experiences are sometimes traumatic ones, but not always. And it binds the characters together in a way that becomes a unique bond. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, in one of the stories we're going to talk about, that bond is a shared experience of school together mm -hmm. and their life at the school. And then there's filial love. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't really like the word platonic because of its non-sexual denotation, but... I think filial is a better term. It's a Greek term, and it represents a deep, long-lasting friendship. Now, that doesn't mean that there may not be a sexual or romantic love as well, but some Yuri relationships are only filial, and some are filial as well as having other forms of love. Mm -hmm. This is not a either-or scenario. These are relationships can be multifaceted, mm -hmm. like an emerald. And then enlist the soul. Sorry, I'm regressing. Now, we talked about secondary factors in girls' love, aesthetic attraction, mania, playful flirting, power exchange, skinship. Uh, all that stuff still applies. And I want to get down to the character plot roles because I did some refining and adding based on reading I've done. Mm -hmm. And eventually, this document is going to include a very long list of Yuri works with added content. Mm -hmm. And one of the character roles and plots that I wanted to talk about is the devout. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting one because it is paired with another character type called the goddess. Mm -hmm. The goddess is an object of devotion by a devout. Now, why are they an object of devotion? It may be they are extremely pretty. There is a Yuri series out there about a girl who's a member of an up-and-coming idol group who several other girls are obsessed with mm -hmm. in different ways, one healthy, one unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And she's a goddess. And the goddess may or may not be aware of the devout's dedication to them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they are stuck up or even that they're perfect. Mm -hmm. what makes them a goddess is nothing more or less than another character is devout and fixated on them. Mm -hmm. And a devout could be a yandere, mm -hmm. but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Could be somebody who just is fixated on them. For example, in the series I was just thinking of with the uh, girl who's an idol, she's not stuck up. She's very nice. She's very down to earth. She's flattered when somebody says that they like her group's music. Mm -hmm. And she's not weird about it at all. Mm -hmm. The next one, and this is the third one I added for this iteration of the analysis, is the opportunist. And this is a weird one. And I don't see this a lot in Yuri. But they are someone who's very practical in their sexual relationship choices. Now, maybe they're pan. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not even homosexual or bisexual or attracted to other women, but they're willing to try it out because it somehow is advantageous to them to do it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's because they're paying off a debt or there's some weird bet that they can't back out of, or maybe they're a master manipulator and this is a means of manipulating another character. Mm -hmm. I've seen that as well. It tends to be a plot arc in Yuri I don't tend to care for. No, but it is interesting because when it's done in a sweet-toned story, it is usually somebody who is pan or pan-ish, and they discover something about themselves in the course of it. Mm -hmm. Not always. Now, I'm going to divide plot roles from character archetypes. Mm -hmm. And these are personality archetypes. First up being the emo queen. Mm -hmm. 
I probably don't have to go into depth about what's an emo queen. Mm -hmm. But they rarely show feminine embellishments. They may be very attractive. They may be socially withdrawn. They may only interact with others in order to push them away. It is often a persona created as a defense mechanism, mm -hmm. which somebody else may get through in the course of the story. Mm -hmm. The Girl Next Door. This is the classic Playboy archetype, uh, play, meaning Playboy magazine. They're pretty, they're sexy, but they're also relatable. They're desirable, but they don't put so much effort into their appearance that it's because they're really trying to be sexy. They don't have to. They're genuine and down to earth. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely not pick-me girls. In fact, they're pretty much the opposite of the pick-me girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I don't really see the pick me girl much in Yuri, so I've not listed that as an archetype. Yeah, it just it. I think one of the reasons it doesn't show up in Yuri very often is there's very rarely big male characters in Yuri. It tends they tend to be mostly female cast. Right, and there are sometimes male characters, but yeah, not enough for it to happen. A lot. And they normally only temporarily show up to move the plot around or to be background furniture kind of like right. a father or a brother or something and obviously there are exceptions i'm not going to go into the exceptions right now yeah because that's not important mm -hmm. okay the next one the ice queen mm -hmm. now this is like the step up from the emo queen mm -hmm. she doesn't so much push others away as create a barrier of hostility and coldness around themselves mm -hmm. They're often very good at their jobs. They're often represented as, say, a senior office worker that the others look up to, even if they're intimidated by her. Uh -huh. Or maybe a upperclassman in the high school who's the head of the student council and has a lot of responsibility for a student. Mm -hmm. And they often have a less severe personality outside that social context. Like, if you meet them at home, Suddenly, they're no longer the super serious, severe head of the student council, but have a softer side mm -hmm. that another character discovers. Mm -hmm. Then the kawaii girl. Mm -hmm. This could be a lot of different things. Maybe she's a Harujuku girl. Maybe she's something else. But she is the girl interested in fashion, makeup, being really girly. Mm -hmm. She's probably attractive, at least averagely so. And often emulates popular behavior. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in this day and age, we'll generally have a big social media following. Mm -hmm. But it depends on what time period the manga takes place. Right. But they are interested in being a girly girl and cute and attractive. Maybe for guys. Maybe because they just like it themselves. Mm -hmm. And then there's the non-human. Now, I take this terminology from the 1948 novel of the same name by Osama Desai. Uh, it's been remade into manga by uh, Ito. It is a highly influential novel in Japanese literature. And this goes far beyond an emo or ice queen. This is not a persona, but a reflection of deep personal social alienation and depression where they no longer really qualify as being a human being mm -hmm. in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. And if you have a non-human as a character in a Yuri, it is time for trigger warnings. Mm -hmm. They are probably going to be suicidal, violent, uh, with deep trauma. Mm -hmm. and, but it does happen in Yuri literature, mm -hmm. uh, including a small but significant genre of nonfiction Yuri. Mm -hmm. Such as one that I don't think we've talked about on the podcast but My Lonely Life as a Lesbian, mm -hmm. uh, which has several autobiographical follow-ups. Mm -hmm. So now let's get into the titles. I'm going to skip around a little bit. I'm going to start with NTR, Netsuo Trap, mm -hmm. by Kodama Naoko. Uh, for each of these, I kind of have a format, so I'll go through the details some. But I'll try to pause if you want to interject. Mm -hmm. Now, this was one of the first pieces of Yuri I read, and I thought it was a good introduction. Mm -hmm. From Wikipedia, the description is, Yuma and Hotaru have been best friends since childhood. Yuma would protect Hotaru from things such as bullies and made it her job to look after her. Now the two are second year high school students, but Hotaru is anything but innocent. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe the cover art to volume one? 
uh, interesting. Um, it presents two of them very close up in traditional anime slash manga school girl outfits with their chest unbuttoned and very close up hugging. Right. Going in for a kiss, it looks like. Holding hands. Right. Now, Kodama Naoko is a female artist and writer, and she draws sexy girls, mm. and she likes putting them in flirtatious situations. Mm -hmm. There is more fan service in the course of NTR than any other ten yuris combined that I've read. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I've put off reading it a little bit. I don't tend to like heavy fan service in anything but, I read. Hold on. I, I, I'm going to have to qualify. I don't think it's heavy fan service. I, when I say ten, as much as ten others, that's a reflection on how little fan service is usually in Yuri. Yeah. I mean, you never see them nude in the series. Mm -hmm. And what you really get is Hotaru doing things to walk in on Yuma as she's changing clothes maybe pulling a shirt off her while she has a bra on, you know, things to that could be interpreted as just being playful and embarrassing, but is really Hataru's really poor way of communicating her physical interest in Yuma. Yeah, and, and once again, and I've, and I've heard that from people who've read it, and it's still one of the reasons I've kind of avoided reading. It doesn't tend to be my thing. And that's okay. I just don't want you to over and avoid something because you think it has more uh, sexual content than it mm -hmm. does. Yeah. It really doesn't. But I suspect there was a desire to appeal to a non-Yuri crowd with this as yeah, well. Yeah, which is why I, it tends to be something I don't particularly enjoy. But I think it is a good introduction to the genre. <laughs> now, the main characters are Yuma and Hotaru. Interestingly, as terms of personality archetypes, they're both girls next door. <laughs> in the plot, though, their roles are very different. Yuma is an ingenue. She's very innocent to things. She doesn't understand her own feelings or reactions. Mm -hmm. She's going out with a boy because, essentially, well, she's normal. So she must be heterosexual and must like boys, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Hotaru is the one that kind of throws the wrinkle in that, who is a minx in terms of plot role. Because she goes after Yuma, but of course, in order to make the comp the plot complicated, Hataru won't just come out and say it, because she's afraid of being rejected and losing Yuma's friendship. Mm -hmm. So, of course, things happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's published in the U.S. by Seven Seas Entertainment. They began publishing it in 2020. And for those who want something that's complete, six volumes, and it's done. There's no more to read. Yeah, it's a pretty short read based yeah. on what I've heard. I will also say that another thing that I think was them being cheeky in marketing is calling it NTR. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with what NTR in Japan is as a genre. I know. It stands for Neto Rare, which is cheating, which is a huge genre of its own in Japan, and Frankly, does not speak well of the Japanese consciousness, in my opinion. Yeah. But it does also play into the book here some, because both of them objectively have boyfriends and are sort of cheating on their boyfriends with each other. Mm -hmm. Sort of. And the title itself is Netzuo Trap, which... Uh, I'm not sure how to explain that into English. The, the term is a little vague. But it kind of means like an imaginary trap mm -hmm. or s something that's fake. Well, their relationships with the boys are fake. Mm -hmm. The next one I want to talk about is one that I think is so far up your alley that I really want you to read it. Mm -hmm. And I really liked it. And I think you might be one of the few other people that would like it as much as I did. Mm -hmm. And it is called Donuts Under a Crescent Moon. I'm so annoyed. I've gone to all my like my regular manga Yuri reading websites trying mm -hmm. to find it, and I can't find it anywhere. I can give you copies. Um, now, my description of it, I did not find a description that I thought did it justice. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a description. 
and I describe it as Hanako is a pretty girl who calls fashion magazines her textbooks. Mm. She's the one on the left with the orangish hair. Mm. At her office, she's fashionable, attractive, and has a circle of other girls that she has lunch with daily. Mm -hmm. Even though she's hitting the point where she can't afford it because she spends so much money on beauty supplies. Mm -hmm. And she desperately hopes that by fulfilling social expectations, she'll be a normal person, attract the right man, and be happy. Mm -hmm. She keeps going on dates with men, mm -hmm. thinking she just has to find the right guy and fall in love and she'll be happy. Mm -hmm. But it never happens. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, Asahi, who is the purple-haired, short-haired one on the right, is five years older, and she's very much respected at their workplace. Mm -hmm. She keeps to herself, brings her lunch, and eats in the park. And Hanako is bewildered by her. Why isn't Asahi afraid of being alone? Mm -hmm. One night after a date, Hanako is crying in the street. And Asahi runs across her. She went out and bought donuts, which she does when she's stressed and feels like she screwed something up. And she shares the donuts with Hanako on the bench. And this starts a relationship that's not immediately romantic, but is based on empathy and respect and then grows out from there. Mm -hmm. Now, Asahi is a lesbian mm -hmm. and has had lesbian relationships. Meanwhile, Hanako's never had any real relationship. Mm -hmm. In terms of archetypes, Hanako is the Kawai girl. Mm -hmm. She likes cute things. She likes being girly. She reads the magazines to find out what's fashionable. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Asahi is an ice queen. Mm -hmm. It turns out that at home, her parents passed away many years ago, and she's had to be very responsible taking care of her younger brother, to the point where she's denied herself having a personal life which, in order to take care of him. Which is a very common Iker tip with the Ice Queen role. Right. The, Normally having either one or both parents dead and kind of having to take on a parent role is very normal. And be responsible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Hanako is the ingenue. Now, Asahi is interesting because normally you see an ingenue paired with a minx. But Asahi is actually kind of an enigma, kind of an ingenue herself. Mm -hmm. She's very innocent, and she doesn't understand that other people may not be what they appear. Mm -hmm. And she's a bit of an enigma, because even though we know she's had lesbian relationships, she still seems very matter-of-fact about everything, almost autistic at times, mm -hmm. but in a way that real people aren't autistic. Just... Difficulty understanding people not being direct and simple. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I like the fact that it's about two office age girls. I Look, I don't mind the high school girls' Yuri tropes, but it is nice to sometimes read about people <laughs> it gets who graduated high school. It gets tiring after a while dealing with with high school conflicts. Right. Now, this again, this is story and art by the same person, in this case, Shiho Yuse, published by Seven Seas Entertainment, which is one of the big publishers of manga in English, uh, and of Yuri manga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It began publishing in 2021 and is four volumes complete, so you can get the whole thing and just read it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I loved about this is by the end of the series, you find out that they are both homoromantic, Mm -hmm. and asexual. Mm. And finding asexual representation is very rare. Yeah, but always nice to see. So they're both romantically inclined towards each other and neither have any interest in a physical relationship. Mm -hmm. so, and I just thought it was sweet and great. And the series does has a lot of will they, won't they, but not juvenile mind games or anything. Mm -hmm. And they like and respect each other. Which is always nice to see. Right. Now, Strawberry Fields once again. Du -du -du -du. <laughs> now, this is still ongoing. Mm. It began publishing in 2020, and there are three volumes. 
as of June 2023, but I believe there are more incoming. Probably need to be translated, but yeah. issues with the good old pandemic. My description of the plot is pure, an attractive, outgoing girl starts attending Akira's school. On the cover art I'm showing you here, Pure is the tall blonde one. Mm. And she's very tall. Mm -hmm. And Akira is much shorter. Akira pushes everyone away and swears off romance after seeing her parents' relationship collapse. Mm. However, she obsessively plays Otome romance games. So maybe she's not really in her heart as dead on romance as she would like to be. Yeah. When Pure meets Akira... She immediately goes up to her and says, you are my true love. Before having said a single word to her. Whoa. And says in the future, you will be my lover. Hmm. And Akira goes, that's awfully presumptuous of you. Uh -huh. and, it, and Pure says, no, I've time traveled. I'm here from the future. You are my lover. Hmm. And that sounds insane until you discover that Akira's shut-in brother has been working on a time machine. Huh. And by the point that I am at in the series, we are getting Bunny Girl Dreams, you know, Rascal Dreams of Bunny Girl Senpai vibes. And time travel stuff is happening. Hmm. That's another really good story. Oh, yeah. It's not Yuri. Yeah. But it's excellent. Mm -hmm. One of the few, like, hetero romances in anime and manga I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. So, story and art by Kazura Kinosaki, published by Yen Press, another big publisher of English manga trans and translation. And I admit, the first volume or two, I was like, eh. But once the time travel stuff started, I'm like, I'm definitely giving this a couple more volumes to try out. Yeah. That sounds interesting. It is. So, archetypes, Akira is an emo queen. Mm-hmm. Again, responsibilities, taking care of her brother, parents' relationship fell apart. So similar to the Ice Queen. Mm -hmm. But she's not cold. She's actively hostile to people to keep them away. Mm -hmm. Pure, who's a girl next door. Now, Pure is a devout. Mm -hmm. She worships uh, Akira. Mm -hmm. Obsessed with her. Akira's existence is her motivation. Mm -hmm. However, Akira is not really a goddess. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is technically. And I need to update my document here. My terminology changed some. Mm. But she's also an opportunist. She doesn't seem interested in a relationship or sex. It doesn't seem to even be on her radar as something to care about. But she will date Pure in order to further her goals. Mm. And I have to say... Akira is not the most likable character so far. I'm interested in seeing how she might evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of interesting. If she, if the writer's goal is to have her become more likable overall. Because that's something you don't super see in Yuri very often. They normally like to have the main protagonist, who, if you do see their eyes only through them, they try to make them likable mm -hmm. from the start. And this, I think, might have more legs to it. Now, I've read the first two volumes. I've started the third. I've kind of decided to wait for the fourth volume come, to come out. Because mm -hmm. I kind of feel like I'm going to want to read a big chunk of it at once. Do you sense a cliffhanger? Be honest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's why. <laughs> yeah. And at the beginning of the third volume, time travel stuff has happened. And people have been erased from history. Am I the only one who's noticing more and more time travel in, like, manga and anime? I think it's always been there. Mm. But that's just my theory. Okay, the fourth one. This is Story and Art by Yuama. As you may notice, I tend to have a preference for story and art done by the same person. I feel like it gives a more unified vision yes. of the creator. I really like this art style. Yes. And... I am biased towards art styles I like. There's one that I've had trouble reading called Yuri Bear Storm because I hate the art style. I'm not going to lie. I'm the same way. I will read something because I really like the art and I will actively avoid reading something if I don't like the art. Well, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, I come more from the literary side of analysis, but this is a media where the art and text 
are towards one common goal of telling a story. Mm -hmm. Okay, the summer you were there. Uh, description by the publisher. Shizuku is a shy high schooler who hardly talks to other people. Instead, she loses herself in writing, crafting a novel that she never intends to show anyone. But when her cute popular classmate, Kaori, gets her hands on Shizuku's manuscript, everything changes. Mm. Kaori suggests that in order to give Shizuku material for her next book, the two of them should start dating. Mm. Can this mismatched pair create their own happily ever after? Now, this is technically true, but maybe a little misleading. Mm. And we have to talk about the characters, archetypes, and roles here. Kaori is a girl next door. Mm. She's sweet. She's nice. But Shizuku is a non-human. Mm. She doesn't see value in her own existence. Mm. And not casually like she's emo. But, like, she could as easily kill herself as wake up. Mm. And her trauma is very deep. Mm. But Kaori really locks onto her. And Kaori definitely plays the role of a devout. And because of that, in the plot, Shizuku is a goddess. Mm. And this, usually a goddess, is a girl next door, a minx, maybe an ingenue. But a goddess being a non-human, somebody who feels so alienated from other humans, being such an object of adoration, is a very rare combination. Mm -hmm. And this is because of the book. Kaori reads the book, which Shizuku intended to destroy. Mm -hmm. She intended nobody to ever read it. Mm -hmm. And Kaori loves it. Aww. This is being published uh, by Seven Seas Entertainment. Again, it began being published just last year in 2022. And as of right now, there are three volumes out with the fourth one scheduled not for another six months in January 2024. <laughs> I've read the first two volumes so far. I've not read the third. I'm really enjoying it. I have to admit I'm a little scared because I'm getting I want to eat your pancreas vibes. I've actually avoided watching the movie they made of it because you told me about it. The anime or the live action? Uh, anime. Uh, I've not seen it either. The For those who aren't familiar with it, I Want to Eat Your Pancreas is a shonen work basically about a boy who befriends a girl who's dying. And it is heart-wrenching. Yeah, you told me you cried all the way through it. Yes, I cried. I cried. And for anyone who's like, oh, a great man cried, go fuck yourself. Yeah. It was tragic. Mm hmm And I cry at things that aren't even that sad. Yuri makes me regularly cry. Oh, I'm a sappy bitch. I mean, I'm going to say it. I'm a, I'm a grown-ass bear of a man who's a sappy bitch for movies. Mm -hmm. I can be watching a romantic comedy and like... Oh my god, it's so sweet. They got together finally. I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. I, I spent a lot of my life in my like 20s and 30s being ashamed of that because that's not how a man is. I'm past that now. I'm too old to give a shit what people think. <laughs> yeah. I'm a sappy ass bitch. Mm -hmm. I love romances and I love seeing people get together and I cry when characters I like have bad things happen to them. Mm -hmm. I was recently reading a Brandon Sanderson book and a character, it had been spoiled for me that he was going to die, and I still found myself choking up while getting to that part. Mm -hmm. Jesus. So, yeah, I'm kind of concerned about I want to eat your pancreas vibes here, because I'm getting this vibe that something's wrong with Kaori, and she's kind of dedicating the last part of her life to reaching out to and connecting with uh, Shizuku. And spoiler alert for people who only read, like, Yuri's that get into, like, popular circles. Because there are some Yuri readers who only read stuff that gets really mainstream. Right. Not all Yuri's have happy endings. Oh, no. Spoiler not at all. Spoiler alert. Many have bittersweet endings. Some are tragic. Mm -hmm. Yuri is about girls' love and those relationships and does not guarantee happy endings. Mm -hmm. Which is part of what, as a Yuri reader, keeps me engaged. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe the plot's going one way, and then the writer gets bored one day and decides to stab your heart. Right. Absolutely. 
Now, while Yuri is notable, I want to say that I wanted to give a shout out, and I will expand this list as we go. I want to give a shout out to non-Yuri works that I would recommend for Yuri readers. Mm -hmm. And the first one is I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, which we just mentioned. But I also want to mention a series called After the Rain, mm -hmm. which is very much a hetero work, mm -hmm. although there is one homosexual male relationship in it as a side story, supporting plot point. Yeah. And, but these are stories about relationships between people. Mm -hmm. They're not strictly Yuri, but they're, if you like Yuri because you like relationship stories, these are going to be right up your alley as mm -hmm. well. All right. Well, I know it's not Pride Month anymore. We missed it. But as far as I'm concerned, we can talk about Yuri any t damn time we want. Yeah. Us homos are exclusive to one month. You're not a homo. You're bi. I know. I recently described myself to people as professor sexual. <laughs> I, I'm just attracted to what... Well, you know, here's the thing. So, I'm hetero. Mm -hmm. Always have been. I'm comfortable with it. You know, uh, I had a homosexual friend when I was a teenager. He was very much in the closet because we lived amongst a bunch of rednecks. Mm -hmm. And my questioning my sexuality lasted about two minutes. Mm -hmm. Because it pretty much consisted of do I find guys sexy? Nope. Okay, ready to move on. <laughs> I mean, that's how comfortable I am in that, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. But maybe because of that, you know, I hear people who are like, I would could never, 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 never. There's, what, 8 billion people on this planet? Maybe there's some guy out there that would do it for me. I find it hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. But anything's possible. Mm -hmm. It's a weird, wide world. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I, I'm not going to tell people to not use labels like bisexual, pansexual, demisexual, homosexual, whatever. If if those labels are useful for people, fine. And mm -hmm. people need generalizations for convenience. Communication is important. But the truth is, at the end of the day, if you get past labels and you get past the need to communicate things briefly and simply, everybody's sexuality is just them and what they're attracted to. Mm -hmm. And it can be simple, and it can be complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the guy out there that's only attracted to living Barbie dolls who've been completely shaped by plastic surgery mm -hmm. to fit a non-human stereotype. And then there's the pansexual who literally would sleep with anything with a pulse and maybe some with that. Mm -hmm. And then everything in between. Yeah. So, and, and people with tons of conditional aspects to their romantic or sexual proclivities. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I am sure there are some demisexuals out there with criteria so narrow that it will be a miracle if they ever find another human being to actually connect to. I know someone like that. I'm, I fear for them. I've known several like that. I just pray they're not sleeping with anime body pillows. <laughs> and a, anime sexual is a whole other thing. We don't, that's not really You don't. It's a real thing. I know. I choose to believe it's not real. You choose to believe it's not real. <laughs> and you know what the interesting thing to me is? What? <laughs> People make stereotypes about how it's always male anime sexuals. I have known a lot of female anime sexuals. Those husbando body pillows, there's a market. Okay. And we're going to leave off with that, dear lecture listeners. Husbando body pillows. I've ended up in some weird social struggles before that I've left very quickly. That's fair enough. So next week, Sandman, The Wake. Ooh. And that will be the end of The Sandman itself. That makes that kind of makes me sad. I've really, actually, really been enjoying Sandman. I'm going to be sad to see it end. It is. Now, we are still going to do a couple of Sandman specials. Mm -hmm. We, I'm debating doing The Dream Hunters. Because I'm not sure I can really do anything meaningful about it other than sit here and read it to people. But <laughs> Right. But I do recommend it. It's good. Uh -huh. um, Endless Nights is particularly interesting. It is stories by Neil Gaiman with a whole bunch of guest writers. Mm -hmm. 
I do have to slap out a bit of a content warning because it, for example, has a story by Milo Manera in it with nudity, I'm pretty sure. Mm. Um, for those people who'd be surprised that Neil Gaiman would do a story with Milo Manera, um, Neil Gaiman has done stories with people like the guy who did Cherry Pop-Tart. And I don't mean a side story. Neil Gaiman has written a Cherry Pop-Tart story, mm -hmm. which is pure smut. Mm -hmm. Neil Gaiman is... I think yeah. it's fair to say most writers have written smut at some point, either for fun or for profit. Maybe not under their real names, but they've done Yeah. Yeah. I assume, well, I should say under another nom de plume, because many of them don't write under their real names to begin with. Yeah. Under a different pseudonym than their yeah. usual writing one they're known for. And then past the specials, and I'm doing it in this order because they're kind of the order they were published in, then we are going to do, do the prequel series, Overture, which is going to get into a lot of cosmology questions. And I think, because you were particularly struggling with the how can he die but not be dead question, mm -hmm. there is content in Overture that will give that more context for you. Oh. And his description of the facet may become more meaningful then. Ooh, okay. Okay. So, next lecture up, Sandman the Wake. Mm -hmm. And until then, read something, you feckin' bastards. <laughs> a comic book, a book, anything, just read. Okay, class is dismissed, but you are not. I have a quick info dump for you. If you want to listen to more of the podcast, we are available everywhere. We are on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, even on YouTube. Additionally, you can find me on social media, on Mastodon, Twitter, Tumblr, TikTok. I probably have a copy of the podcast on an iPod mini in a hobo's pocket in San Francisco. That's right, time travel. Do you want to know where you can find all these links? You can find them on my link tree. That is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash Prof Hamby, P-R-O-F-H-A-M-B-Y. It is the comics course. And don't forget your homework.